Hi and welcome to Autocar Deep Drive. It's where we drive further into the news and bring you some insights and analysis on all the things that have happened recently in the world of automobiles. And today's episode, we are going to be discussing the EV fires. Now, no doubt you've seen all of the videos uh, of the recent spate of electric scooters going up in flames. Should you be alarmed? Are they safe? What can you do to minimize the risk? Well, that's what we're going to be discussing today. So first up, are they safe? Yes, absolutely. Remember, all vehicles catch fire. No doubt you've seen some of them perhaps on the road too. Internal combustion engine vehicles do go up in flames at times and electric vehicles are therefore no different in that sense. Of course, with all of the news around EVs, no doubt they're getting a lot of spotlight and therefore news about fires is quite alarming. Furthermore, the fires themselves are quite alarming when you look at them visually. You know, you've got lots of gases and smoke, uh, you know, rising up. Uh, the fires, they themselves are pretty hard to control. Uh, so that's really what brings a lot of attention to EV fires and makes them appear quite dramatic and quite scary indeed. Now, that's what we're going to be discussing. And the first thing I want to discuss with you is why do they catch fire in the first place? Thankfully, the government has set up a panel to investigate and find out just what is causing the recent spate of fires. We will know, of course, all of the details once the whole analysis and the probe finds, uh, you know, the root cause. But until then, here is what typically starts off electric vehicle fires. Now, the first thing is a short circuit. Now, a short circuit, uh, you know, with a wiring fault will obviously raise temperatures. And once temperatures rise, your battery will ignite and catch fire. The other thing that can also cause an electric vehicle fire is a faulty BMS or a battery management system. Now the battery management system is the electronic brain of uh, the, the electric vehicle. It controls the rate at which a battery charges and discharges, making sure of course that the temperature is also always under control. Now if there is some fault with the software and it lets that temperature rise, that's when you can have another possible fire. The third reason can be faulty charging. As with your mobile phones, think about it. Mobile phone manufacturers tell us all the time to use the correct chargers and cables and the same goes for EVs. If you use a non-standard cable or a faulty wall socket, you can have trouble. Uh, the sockets need to be earthed properly, cables need to be of good quality. So obviously using something of an inferior quality or a faulty cable can be another reason why you could end up with your electric vehicle going up in flames. And then there is cell quality and that is something that has been worrying most users and most of the public. What about the quality of these vehicles and their batteries themselves? Yes, quality is an important aspect. Even a slight contamination within a cell can cause it to raise its temperature at some point during its life cycle, leading to a vehicle fire. And so, uh, you know, cell quality, making sure they're manufactured with the strictest of quality controls is crucial. And then, of course, there's accidental damage. That too can trigger an electric vehicle fire. Now, if unfortunately you are in an electric vehicle accident, you know, the accidental damage can cause a battery to dent or perhaps even rupture. And that's when the chemicals start mixing and short circuits can happen, leading to an electric vehicle fire. Famously, if you remember Richard Hammond, when he crashed uh, on the Grand Tour, the Rimac electric concept, that car went up in flames because of accidental damage. Apparently, what happened there is hot oil and the hot batteries, well, they didn't gel well together and everything went up in flames. Now, interestingly, if you read reports about that incident, that car burned for about four to five days. And that is the next thing that we're going to be discussing. Why are EV fires so difficult to control? Now, the problem really is in two words, thermal runaway. What that is, is essentially a phenomena where even if one cell catches fire, that rise in temperature raises the temperature of adjacent cells. And well, you just have one cell after the other catching fire. And the challenging bit about an EV fire is being a chemical fire, it doesn't even require oxygen to burn or rather atmospheric oxygen because the chemicals inside produce that oxygen sort of fueling the fire and that's what is called thermal runaway. It's essentially just a runaway where one cell after the other ignites in a sort of uh, self-fulfilling loop and even starving the fire of oxygen as you do sometimes to fight conventional fires 
doesn't work in this case. The only thing that you can do is to lower the temperature so that the chemical reaction slows down and stops and that is typically done by dousing it with huge amounts of water. Now there too there is one little rider you can't use seawater uh, because the salt in there will actually speed up the chemical reaction but yes regular water is just fine. You only need huge amounts of that water to lower the temperature. Now once that is under control you still have to observe the cell or the vehicle because it can reignite what happens is in in a fire you could have damage in adjacent cells you might have lowered the temperature uh, but moving the vehicle uh, can cause a sort of things to mix and a reignition is possible in fact firefighters around the world are slowly developing uh, standards to deal with these EV fires. In India our sources in the Mumbai Fire Brigade tell us that they have also now instituted an observation time of 72 hours uh, which is up from 48 hours for internal combustion vehicles. After that the fire uh, department or the fire brigade states that the car is safe and it's handed over but for 72 hours is what they keep it under observation. So is there anything being done in terms of battery technology to improve things with respect to safety or is it all about extracting more range? No, there's a lot being done uh, with her cells and their construction and chemistry to improve safety as well. Now you would have heard of nickel based batteries and possibly also lithium ferrous batteries or rather NMC and LFP batteries. Now the nickel based batteries they do have a higher energy density and are obviously preferred for better range, uh, you know, something that every EV wants. But there are a few firms and notably it's the Chinese uh, like BYD for instance who are using LFP cells too. Now the LFP by its nature, uh, you know, doesn't uh, react as violently as nickel based cells if they are even punctured directly. And what BYD has done quite intelligently is they've used a very long uh, blade like construction. So if you look at the typical cells, uh, you have a pouch cell which is uh, well think of your mobile phone battery. It's either a pouch or a prismatic cell in there which is just a small rectangular uh, kind of unit. You have cylindrical cells which are the round ones. Think of your typical AA batteries in your remote controls and then you have now the blade cell which is uh, well an elongated pouch or prism. Now the good thing about the blade cell is it's got a huge surface area rather than have multiple small little pouches or prisms. It's got a huge surface area so the heat dissipation is quite quick and they build it like a heat sink. Perhaps if you've seen uh, you know those aluminium heat sinks with various fins that's what an LFP blade cell uh, sort of battery looks like. So heat control or thermal management is really good there and as I said before uh, the battery chemistry of LFP also doesn't allow for violent reactions. So in both instances, this is quite safe. Now, if you are using nickel based batteries, those can also be engineered to be safe, obviously in terms of quality control, better thermal management, but also in, with respect to choosing pouch cells or cylindrical cells. Now, pouch cells pack up closer together and you do have better energy density for the given space. Cylindrical cells do waste some of that space, you know, as you'd imagine between them. But that wasted space actually also helps with cooling because of the air gaps uh, between them. Uh, and that's what some manufacturers also do. They use cylindrical cells and take advantage of that uh, empty space to better control the temperatures inside the battery pack. So now of course if you already own an EV and you're a little worried or rather you're about to buy one and thinking how can you be safe? Well really it's very very simple just as you would with a normal car with a normal internal combustion engine you would follow a certain uh, set of you know good practices and manufacturers recommended practices the same goes for an electric vehicle too so the first thing is always use the standard cables and a good quality wall socket make sure there is a proper earthing and you've got all of your wiring in tip-top shape Secondly is try and avoid fast charging. Yes, it is very convenient but what it does is it loads the system and also interestingly actually lowers the overall lifespan of the battery. So as far as charging a battery is concerned, the slower is generally better.
And lastly, of course, do take care of your electric vehicles, have them serviced and inspected at the appropriate recommended intervals. And if you do have a swappable battery, make sure you take care of that battery pack too. Don't drop it or dent it because that can also potentially be a huge risk.